You're going to love that. Right? I know you, you're you one of the people who is incredibly sad that we saw the back of that. And it looks like he's been banned, by the way. I think that, that little underscore... Oh, that's the mage, so you're fine. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so you're one of the people who still sort of rues the death of the patron archetype, I think. Yes. And so you're going to be incredibly pleased to see this patron mess OTK being played in the top eight of a national championships. Yeah, I mean, the the patron variants without Warsong Commander are, you know, they're, they're great for what they are, but it, it's like... It's like breaking up with a with a girlfriend and then three years later you reconnect and try and reignite the old flame and it's just not quite there. You know, she's moved on as a person. She's not quite where she was three years ago. She's moved on in her life. So yeah, she's no it, longer charging your credit card bills. Right, exactly. She's she's just giving plus one to all your other charges. <laughs> we should probably stop right there before sure. that goes wrong. Um, so we are going to see match one of the decks that are actually being played. The, the Yogg Mage is... Pretty much the the standout of this tournament so far, honestly, I'd have to say, in terms of, of decks that have been overperforming so far. This is not a deck that I personally put a huge amount of stock into um, mm -hmm. in terms of its power level. But so far in this tournament, it's been performing pretty well for the players that brought it. Yeah, in APAC and in China, we've seen a lot more of the, the Tempo Mage styles than we have in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... Even amongst people who play it in the West, it's regarded as a fringe deck. I don't think anybody really regards it as top tier, but definitely in China and again across the APAC region, it's regarded a lot higher tier over there than it is here. Sure. And uh, just, just looking at the early exchanges between these two players, always like uh, to take a look at people's demeanors when they're, they're settled down and playing, particularly, you know, players that I'm not familiar with. I'm always interested into how they, they react to these kind of high pressure situations. And Nafika looks, looks very. Very, very cool, calm, and collected. He's got a bit of that Naaman look about him, right? Whereas it's, <laughs> it's, it's the cold, dead stem. Looks like he might just murder you if you look at him wrong. Yeah, this is the happy face, and this is the sad face. Right. <laughs> As the Naaman meme goes. Yep. Uh, um, but right now, tool not to play the barns. Well, here's, that's the question. I mean, some decks, you do deliberately leave mana open for barns, right? We're talking about rogue with questing adventure and gadgetan auctioneer you want to leave mana open we're talking about witch doctor shaman with um thunder bluff valiance and wicked witch doctors but hunter you're, you're kind of just using it to try and get a sick death rattle right so the the biggest advantage you can possibly get off that is on turn four so i just like going ahead and jamming it here the only thing that would probably make me play um uh, Infested Wolf? Is that the name of the card? I'm yes, just completely it is. blanked. Okay. The only thing that would make me play Infested Wolf instead is if I also had a Houndmaster sat in my hand that, that would give me a more reliable target to bank the Houndmaster on. But totally agree with the Barnes play here. Yeah, the Barnes, not pulling anything particularly exciting, but it's still two more damage. It's going to be one from the attack and one from. Well, okay, just one from the ping, but then it's eaten two mana, so that's fine as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the Mana Worm just being sacrificed to the Eagle Horn Bow here, which is. Uh, Pretty interesting in and of itself. He's just not valuing that Mana Worm. And I'm not sure how I feel about this play because we've seen Mana Worm, even you know, in some of the previous games that we've seen, like Mana Worm is not a card that completely tails off in the late game. If you're able to do, you know, Mana Worm, Sorcerer's Apprentice, Cult Sorcerer, Arcane Blast, your dude, like all in the same turn on like turn eight or something, that's still a really imposing board state that you build up. So... Just sacrificing this mana worm here is, is really interesting to me. What do you think? Yeah, possibly a little bit of impatience there. Like if he's, if he'd waited for maybe pick up a mirror images or something. Imagine if he drew mirror images next turn. Sure. Uh, suddenly that would just swing it on its head with a mana worm and coins and flame wakers and craziness going off and you protect your 3-3 three, three or your 4-3. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind throwing things out there to die when you do have a, a really full hand of stuff to do in the next few turns, which is what Hugo has, but... I think I might have been greedy with that Mana Worm and just waited one more turn to see. I don't think it's even greedy. It's just it's just responsible, right? It's just managing managing your resources in a responsible manner. I just I, I really don't understand what tossing a Mana Worm out onto the board there really ever achieves. Yeah, and this Hunter... When Hunter gets the board, because Hunter's kind of clunky and doesn't get the board, when it does get the board, it ends up in really good positions really quickly. Oh. That is a spectacular flame waker. I mean, it's it's not caught him up completely because of how far behind he was. But I mean, 
that was about as good as it could have gone, really. I mean, two shots on the Argent Squire actually, you know, takes a, a, the most damage off the board. Like popping open the the Infested Wolf doesn't really do a great deal, especially with the Dire Wolf to back it up. Um, so being able to take care of two minions there with that Flame Waker is actually a really big deal. And now Napico has to consider his opponent's range of things like Arcane Missiles if he just Dire Wolfs and trades mm -hmm. into that, and Quick Shot, you know, being used inefficiently if he chooses not to. So. That Flame Waker outcome has actually put Napaka in a really rough spot now. Yeah, he also needs to work out his hero power management here. He's low on resources compared to what he's going to envisage in Yugo's hand. Mm -hmm. And it may be that he decides right now, am I going to hero power every turn unless I get Call of the Wild? Yep. He may, he may be making that decision on this turn rather than on a future turn. If, he, if he's going to do that, it's a long-term strategy that needs addressing right immediately. Yeah, I think he is just going to choose to use the Unleash the Hounds here. Like I said, just wanting to preserve that that core body of the Infested Wolf because the one ones are just too vulnerable to so many things that the the, the Yog Mage deck wants to do. But also worth talking about at this juncture the the exact makeup of Yugo's hand here. I mean, we've we've seen some Yog Mages so far, but um, you know, if 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 Zake's um, deck was the the fully aggressive version, and then Yatori's mm -hmm. was somewhere in the middle. Then this one has gone all the way the other way, just you know, leaning even over to a control mage. He has an ice block in there, he's got a polymorph in there, all sorts of late game packed in there, probably flame strikes as well, based on this build. So he is fully prepared to go into the later turns. And you know what? Do you know what card you just particularly enjoy turning into a sheep? Is it like a lion? It, it is it is like a lion, yeah. Something okay. like savannah high main as the old caster axiom goes yeah and that's the absolute perfect target coming at the imperfect time for anapica um how do you feel about ice block in these tempo mage style decks um so, obviously they buy you some time sometimes but but yes i mean trailing off on but there is is definitely a good way to end it we saw the scenario in uh, in our previous series right where he, he identified the, the point where he just said, okay, Firelands, Portal, Face, every turn from now on, mm -hmm. I'm burning your face until you die. Those games and those games specifically are the games where Ice Block is really, really useful to have that one extra turn. And you can right. just safely ignore everything your opponent does, right? And just keep firing at face. But it, does every game play out like that? No, absolutely not. And then in a lot of situations, Ice Block is just kind of a dead card in, in, in your hand for a lot of the games. So. So the decision that goes through your mind is basically treating it like a tech card, like feeling out which matchups you're expecting to play and whether you feel that you're going to need that burn scenario more often than not. And Hugo feels that he's going to need that scenario. Yep, absolutely. Um, so Hymane is going to come Ouch. down here. He did, uh, he did manage to dodge playing it on the previous turn. He has pushed through a good chunk of damage here. Um, but the Polymorph is backbreaking here. If he can pick up a tempo play to go with it, he doesn't, which means we're going to see the Ice Block develop. No, he's going to choose to ping off the Sheep instead. Probably a wise move since the Sheep is, of course, still a beast. Can still be an activator for Kill Commands and Hound Masters and all that goodness. So probably a wise decision in the end. And talking wise decisions, it looks like Napika's decision to start using his hero power every turn is the only thing that's even keeping him in with a chance in this game. Like he's done an extra four or six damage because of that choice. Yeah. Ooh, and I mean, if, if Yugo hey. is on 19 or 21 right now, as Napika actually... Okay. What's up? Sorry, uh, yeah, you, you were a little bit ahead of me with the Squire there. Um, I was expecting him to hero power and then just go face next turn with the quick shot. He, he actually okay, used to yeah, clear yeah. the board. Um, oh, I see. Right, 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 yeah. He, he, I, I think respecting the Drake there is reasonable. You're not mm -hmm. even that far ahead in the race. If you look at it, you know, 15 yeah. to 21, if you leave the Drake up, that's basically equalizing the race single-handedly, plus any burn that's in hand. And here you go. I mean, this is, this is basically what I said, right? Ice block, burn at face, buy that one extra turn that you need, and... He doesn't have the burn to back himself up, but he does have Cabalist Tome into potentially more burn. And then he has the the final push of saying, all right, buddy, Yogg, this is this one's down to you. This one's out of my hands now. A, a man cannot achieve victory here. It's in the hands of a god. Do you trust Yogg here? Given that the block hasn't been procced and you have Cabalist Tome? Uh, well, the, the block is irrelevant when you're playing Yogg because it's your turn. That's what I mean, though. It might shoot you in the face. That's why I say, do you trust him? Right. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the ways you can actually lose the game is to, to yog yourself to death. 
I, I totally agree. But that situation only gets worse, right? You, your ice block gets popped, mm -hmm. it gets popped at one, which means your Yogg is even more unreliable the longer you wait in the game. Right, but I was thinking if you Cabalis Tome into some damage and draw some damage, you've got two turns to do just 12. I mean, so you, you've got three random mage spells from Cabalis Tome and you have one random draw from your deck to hit 12 damage. That's pretty unlikely, right? <laughs> Oh, what? Thistle T into RK missiles and with Flame Strike in hand. Okay. Um. So that's a lot. Yeah, the, the high main being silenced is sometimes relevant, relevant, sorry, but the fact that there are other death rattles on the board, it means that the Flame Strike RK missiles line isn't going to be lethal. So he's going to need to pick up burn here and then just get enough of the arcane missiles to hit face on this four minion board lovely but Nupika, from can you like put yourself in Nupika's shoes here for a second your opponent thistle teed last turn those could be torches it could be fireballs it could be frost bolts like you are terrified right now as to what that thistle tea card is yeah and he looks terrified in fairness as well it's the first emotion we've really seen from him since the start it's like i'm scared yeah. Uh, chooses to prop the block on two. There is a blessing on the Argent Squire. Sure, that makes yeah. a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. um, not paying attention to my Yogg there. It's only, if only they had a yellow tinkling effect that would give it away. That is a Roaring Torch. Okay. Boom. That is six. Arcane Missiles. He still needs this an incredible series of missiles. You. No, that is a whiff. And this is getting more and more unlikely as time goes on. He needs a minor miracle now. Okay. Napica's worked out, obviously, what's going on. He knows what the Thistle T's produced. These, all three of these now need to hit face. Nope, not good enough. A good effort from the old god, Mr. Hopes End himself. But it is Hugo's hopes that are going to be ended in this game. And Napica is going to go out to the first game lead with the aggressive hunter. Right, and that's a good one to get out of the way. Obviously, we talk about the big four. So anytime you get one of your decks that's not one of those out of the way, that's a good, you know, a more than a one point win. I keep on about these. Some are better than others. Getting hunter out of the way is definitely one of the big ones to get out of the way. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it's it's worth pointing out that these the, both of these players have have some interesting twists on what they believe the correct lineup to be, right? Right. We're, we're, we're looking at patron warriors and tempo warriors and you know Leroy Miracle Rogues, mid range shamans. You know this is this is not the Fab Four lineups that we're seeing from these two players. They they both have their own unique ideas as to what's strong in in this meta that they're expecting. So um, the interactions between the power decks are not as defining as they would be in you know a, a regular series if you want to put it that way as they are in this. But still a big win for the hunter for sure. I mean that could quite easily you know if the if the roaring torch was one card higher in the deck and the thistle t hit four roaring torches or three roaring yeah. torches then you know he's in a world of trouble and in fairness um we keep on about sort of the the, the power level of the decks but counters to other decks aren't like they used to be mm -hmm. um over the last year i think that the level you just don't see a freeze mage versus a control warrior style matchup very often at all anymore a lot no. of matchups are purely based on sort of fifty-five percent to sixty percent. It's a little bit more defined than something like uh, various data trackers would have you believe. But yeah, you know, there, there's very few outright counters now. Yeah, if you're if you're getting to the the sixty to sixty-five percent favored matchups, like that is a brutal victory for one side. Right? Right. That, it's about as damning as it gets. There are very few matchups left in the game that are pushing beyond 70. I think in our fresh meta, there might be one or two more because the decks are less refined. And yes. some of the decks have you know bigger glaring holes in them that haven't quite been patched up as the decks get refined to perfection. But in the, the more stable metas that we've just been evolving through, that's absolutely the case where uh, a lot of the decks were just approaching 50-50 against each other. And maybe that's why Zoo is less fancied in the tournaments than on Ladder. With everyone experimenting on Ladder, Zoo is always good because it just destroys anything that's not refined. Yeah. But in a more refined meta like a tournament environment, maybe that's why these guys aren't putting their, their faith in Zoo as much as they would maybe on Ladder. That's a great point. 
So... Napica leading out the Tempo Mage of his own here. He has an Emperor Thorosan packed in here. I think every single Yog Mage, Tempo Mage, Mid Range Mage, Flame Waker Mage, Spell Mage, Mage Mage <laughs> that we have seen played so far this tournament has had a dramatically different build. Right, and Emperor is one of those cards that I'm surprised isn't in it more often. When you've got Flame Wakers in your deck, mm -hmm. it just seems like the ability to save those guys. Like playing Flame Wakers are really. For a card that's so hated, it's a remarkably hard card to play very, very efficiently. Uh, you, you quite often, if you're not careful, wait too long or you stick it down too early. Yeah. But if you've got Emperors in your deck, then holding on to it longer becomes a very viable option. Yeah, absolutely. And normally, um, Emperor Thorosan in your deck is indicative of also playing Archmage Antonidas. Um, just you know, turning any and all of those one-mana spells in your deck into zero-mana spells when you're playing Antonidas is just bananas. And um, so I would expect there is a, a Tony packing in here as well. But uh, Napica has a, a pretty good anti-aggro hand here. This is a hand that you would love to see against Zoo, for example. But against the uh, kind of slower, more rampy starts of a, of a Yogg Druid, not really what you're looking for. Yeah. And I mean, how do you progress from here? Do you just try and fill your hand up immediately? That's what he's considering by the look of that coin hover. And, and just try and get something to do on turn three that is anything other than play a, a empty, a bare Flame Waker. I mean, I don't hate raw Flame Waker here. I think this is a perfectly reasonable play. How does three mana Druid deal with a 2-4? Yeah, okay. That's what I mean, there, there, is, there is an answer. It's exactly Feral Rage a lot of the time, or a combination mm -hmm. of a couple of cards. But it, it's, it's a reasonably safe prospect, and then next turn you can... <laughs> choose to, to leverage against an innovate play you can try and snipe down a Maya keeper if that was to come out you can and if nothing were to happen then you have the option of just arcane intellect and get some damage out of it anyway but it's going to work well for him because it's going to take out two cards from hand i i mean is that a result for napica though i think don't you value your flame waker over a raven idol and a living roots from your opponent uh, I think it's close. I mean, you've, okay. you've got rid of those things. They're options he no longer has. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where your opponent stands. I think if he knew Hugo's hand, I would agree with you that sure. Napica's not going to be happy with how this goes on. But at the time, I think it's okay. Okay. Um, so Arcane Blast and the ping, I'm sure, is what we're going to see here. And that nourish that Hugo picked up changes everything about yeah. the dynamic of his hand right now because suddenly his hand full of absolute bricks is going to hopefully, from his perspective, transform into some goodness here. <laughs> he just keeps grabbing innovates. That's a Baron Geddon, Lorinda. Why of is course that he's Baron playing Baron Geddon. Geddon. Why? Why? What? Yeah, okay. So why is there a Baron Geddon? Wow. Uh, that's a way to beat Zoo. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's I mean, a way to beat Dragon Warrior, and the deck has time to play tech cards. I mean, we've seen I, people experiment with all sorts of things. Why not? I, ju I just snapped to the list to see if this is kind of a, a more ramp heavy build, but no, this is this is just Malagos Druid. There's there's no real you know extra late game taunts or anything in that in there. He's just he's just packing a Baron Geddon. Okay, so with the portal and the Baron Geddon. <laughs> Maybe we can say that he's valuing the Maligos combo a bit higher as a combo than other people. So uh, he wants he wants to sustain and stall the game for longer yes. using extra ball clear and extra healing and then really build up to the actual Maligos combo. Yeah, as opposed to other people, like you sure. said, they're sort of ignoring the Maligos combo and just using it as a 412 dragon with some decent upside yeah. that can kill you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can get down with that, sure. So I feel that he's going to just play this deck as a far more combo orientated deck. I mean, he can do what he likes with it. That's the beauty of it. But that, that's what the build's suggesting. That's a Baron Geddon. I was going to say, you innovate Hero Power here over the Moonfire, right? I like, would, yeah. Yeah, Moonfire is just one of the strongest cards in your deck. And those innovates are getting weaker and weaker as each turn progresses. So Stole my line. That's exactly what I was going to say, word for word. <laughs> Get your own material, Lorinda. That's that's the moral Damn of the story it. here. Yeah, this is what happens when you cast with someone who taught you a lot about the game. Yeah. They steal your lines. I'm not. I'm not sure that logic checks out. Shush. All right. So uh, this Moonglade portal is going to. I mean, the resources used to kill all these cards are, are really hurting Napica here. This this is going to be 
pretty big blow to him. It's, I mean, it's not ideal, but he is staring at a Firelands portal right now. So, I mean, he would have seen that Firelands, but the, uh, sorry, the Moonglade portal going off and just been sat thinking to himself, just any number below five, any number below five. He got it. He got a four, four. And that Doomsayer is about to be, oh, so validated. Wow. Yeah, he's going to be pretty pleased about this. Unlike Yugo, or Yugo doing the thing that Druid does, just when you think it's getting to rogue standard of terrible-looking mid-game hands, Druid seems to pull its way out of it more often than Rogue does when it gets these awkward-looking hands and just go crazy. And that's what like it's this. doing here. This is cute. It's it's a little touch, but like, why not get one damage on that thing, right? While yeah. you can before it gets buffed. It's like I said, the innovates are just getting useless. Um, but have you met our Lord and Savior Flame Strike? And that is going to be seven to the dome from Napica, but it is going to be immediately met with Malagos and Moonfire. And did we or did we not hero power this thing last turn? Exactly. That one point of damage making a gigantic difference now. Really good spot from Hugo setting this up. Uh, he is obviously in a world of pain currently, but he does have, as a druid, quite a few comeback mechanisms with more card draw. And, of course, his own Yogg is sitting in that deck of about 15 cards still. Yep. Um, so now Napica has to has to find his line. Is it... Do we do we race Malagos on the board, right? That's that's question number one. Do I we... mean, you don't, right, because Swipe wins yes. that game. Yeah, almost single-handedly. In fact, entirely single-handedly. So at that point... Are you relying on Yogg-Saron to be able to clear Malagos? In which case, is the play just double Frostbolt face, ping face? But Yogg-Saron clearing Malagos is nowhere near as good as Yogg-Saron clearing a whole board of 3-3s three or 4-3s three or something. Sure. Which is why a 4-12 is different, guys, to 4-4-3s. Four, four Those numbers are not how you add them. So... I'm going to be honest, I have no idea what you just said. I'm just saying that um, you don't add stats when you're evaluating a card. I see. Right. Okay. Good. I'm with you. And Malagos is better than four one threes, is what I was trying to say. And Druid doing what it does, just picking up Nourish at the right time and <laughs> starting again. Malagos is better than two pantry spiders. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, but it costs nine and they only cost six. Yep. TJ will be distressed at this information. And there, as you called it, um, is the Archmage set up? Oh god, this is, this is like a quick fire round of Jeopardy or something. Having to like figure out what these cards are. Polymorph? No, never mind. Wow, yeah. Ooh. And Ooh. Nabika praising the Yog, by the way. Uh, that Huffer is okay. I was going to say that Huffer's dead because it's not green. I was going to try and work out how it died, but then spoilers, as always. Just <laughs> spoilers. That Malagos is alive, alive and kicking. That was a hell of a Yog. But the Malagos is alive. What is life where you can end up with a 4-3 sheep at the end of your blank oh! board? <laughs> From I think you may be a fraction heavens. ahead of the action, by the way. But yeah, that swipe with Malagos on the board says, Yog, you're no longer in charge of this scenario. Yeah, and that was more or less, I think, Napica's last gasp. He just has he just has no outs in his deck to Malagos anymore, right? unless he can, I mean, he find, can turn... a way, excess... find a way to just get lethal, right? He can turn excess mana into a fireball. Yep. <laughs> There's some really strange things happening in this game of Hearthstone. There are. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, what other outs does he have? I'm not even sure if this can be called an out, just getting two fireballs here. I think he's going to need to pick up a third spell here that he can turn immediately into a, fire, a fireball. That is not it. That is one mana too much, but probably worth using the intellect here over just missiles and ping if you're only going to end up casting one spell anyway. Yeah. Napica agrees. Oh, does that change anything, getting the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Uh, it means if he draws a, no, it just doesn't. He'd need to draw like a second apprentice and a third fireball in the same turn without spending any mana, and he just can't do that. So, and that would allow him to cast three fireballs in the same turn, but right, uh, even that isn't going to get him over the line. And that swipe off the Azure Drake 
that yog whiffing on the polymorph. The polymorph was cast, just not at the right target. And back-to-back -back swipe pickups are going to mean that Yugo squares up this game. Yeah, and, well, one all. I just confused myself there as the mage defeat symbol came up in Japanese. And I was like, mage just lost, right? But that's what defeat means. It is. So Story one game out. all. And you go and Napika going at it with well, pretty interesting lineups with the really interesting Baron Geddon slowing that druid right down. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it was incredibly effective, right? In in that game, in particular, if we're going to take our sample size of one game, then it was a hell of a card to bring in his deck. So um, I just just correcting myself, I think I may have said one all there. It's two zero to Napika, right? Is it? Because Mage has lost twice. Oh, that was my fault then. I said that coming out of the game, which is where you got that impression from, more than likely. Right. That is my fault. And then the mage popped up and said defeat, and I took it as victory based on your fault. Yeah, we're two zero. Castles are never wrong. It's two zero for sure. Sweet. All right. Nailed it. Um, so Hugo is going to have to find a win with that tempo mage, and obviously we've done the thing earlier where we've discussed. You know, people are more likely to requeue, so it'd be interesting to see if he stubbornly keeps going with the mage, or if he just changes it up for a fresh look. I'm not convinced. I'm pretty sure it's still one all. Okay. <laughs> so the game one was Hunter versus the Mage. Who won? Yes. Napica won with Hunter. And game two was the Druid versus the Mage. Yes. But it was a different player playing the Mage because we talked right. about Emperor coming out. So that's one all then. Why didn't you say so? <laughs> Is it? Oh, we've lost the plot now. Yeah, we've yeah. we've lost it. The, the problem when... Um, my production involves watching the feed and writing things down yeah. in the wrong place. Yeah. Sometimes leads to this discussion, and I'm very sorry for that. Napika did indeed lose because he was praying to Yog at the bottom of the screen with his mage deck. So it mm -hmm. is indeed one all. Sweet. Sorry for any confusion there, guys. You, you made me doubt myself, Neil. Which was the whole object of the episode? When, when does that ever happen? Right. Exactly, right? Moving... I, I won, even if the production was lowered there by my, my winning. I'm sure. so sorry, chat. Anyway, so moving, moving swiftly, swiftly on. forward. <laughs> the <laughs> mages and druids are more or less out of this series now. We've, we've, seen, we've seen the mages and druids come out. There are still one remaining from each side. But I, personally, am looking forward to some of these more wonky decks coming out. That's what I want to see. I want to see... The patron OTK charge. I want to see the mid-range shamans. I want to see Tempo Warrior in 2016. Tempo Warrior is still baffling to me. I, I don't see many situations where it is better than Dragon Warrior. Although I guess patron might be one of those. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely a possibility. I mean, his list is just so old school, though. Um, looking over it, I mean, he's even packing the Arathi Weaponsmith, which is just such a throwback at this point. Crazy stuff, but it is going to come down to the Tempo Mage. And we get the confirmation on screen that Sosa was right all along, and the game, that the match is tied. One yeah, that's, that's what I said. One. Anyway, one all, and <laughs> Navika with the hand that would make this called Tempo Mage if this was the hand you always got. Yes. <laughs> the hand that we think of as Tempo Mage is this mana worm into some spells and some buffs and off you go. Yeah. And this and is why people refuse to drop the name. And this is the hand that you need to know how to mitigate, right? If right. you're if, if your opponent plays turn one mana worm against you, the worst thing you can do is try and create board tension. That's what they want you to do. They want to snowball that mana worm by arcane blasting and frostbolting your stuff. So your priority is to just remove at all costs. And this matchup in particular, the Tempo Mage Mirror, can be really weird because both players, if they're familiar with this matchup, know that. So both players are trying not to be the first one to overcommit to the board because then they get the huge swing coming back at them with the Flame Waker turn, with the Cult Sorcerer Arcane Blast turn. So it's a really, really cagey match until it just like absolutely blows up somewhere in the mid lane. And it's actually going to blow up really quickly here if he wants to, with Sorcerer's Apprentice into... Oh, my goodness, he's got so many options. Uh, he can kill a lot of things here and do a lot of stuff. Apprentice 
Blast Coin Frostbolt is a board clear if he wants it. He can load up the Mirror Image as well, but the Mirror Image is pretty pointless this time because he has the Mana Worm in hand. Right. This is kind of the, the counterpoint to the, the debate we started in, in the previous series about, sure, I mean, there's, there's just no harm in having the Mirror Image on board already. But in this case, he's staring at a Mana Worm in his hand. So, of course, there is an additional synergy to keep the Mirror Image for the following turn. So I feel like you babbling book here and see where you stand. Absolutely. Uh, the one the one attack is actually useful. You, he's not going to want to ping that. So, And you don't stand in a very good position here. So, Yeah, but no big deal. He can still ping out the Sorcerer over two turns. He'll be hoping not to see uh, Arcane Intellect, which is usually the biggest punish for, losing, for leaving a Sorcerer's Apprentice alive if you don't have a board presence of your own, right? If you didn't just, like, drop minions into it, in which case, obviously, the Frostbolts and Fireballs and everything else is the punish. But if you've just left the Apprentice there chilling, then Arcane Intellect is usually the biggest punish. Right, and both players making sure to, to get what they can out of this hero power here. Yeah. Because Napika's hand, you can see already, he's not taking much damage, he's not facing much damage, and if he just does a couple more hero powers, yeah, he's going to be in a strong position going into that flame strike, going into that Thorasan. Yeah, but you, 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 you saw it all happen, right? Turn two, it was just a little bit of an overcommittal early, and Hugo was able to, to swing the board early mm -hmm. on, so he is in the driver's seat for now because of that. And there you see Napika straight away holding back his resources. This is something that we saw Yugo not do in the previous game against Hunter, where he just threw out his Mana Worm. Um, he's choosing to hold back his Mana Worm here because he knows the value of a swing turn in this matchup. And he knows his opponent has had their swing turn against him. So he needs to find some way to, put, to string together a combo of cards to swing the board back on its head again. And how greedy do you get here? You've got Flame Strike on seven. That's a long way off. It is. Um, but you don't do you have any other real realistic options? I mean just arcane intellect and ping is terrifying, but your opponent does only have five mana, he's not be able to develop too much and you should be able to start dealing with things. I Looking... guess you could also just fireball the mana worm as an option. Yes. Looking at the texture of this hand, fireballing a mana worm is not the most ridiculous idea anyone has ever had, because your opponent has two cards. You have plenty of life. But that plenty can turn into not very much if that mana worm just connects with you a couple of extra times. And your hand is just Emperor, card draw, flame strike, just like value after value after value. So I honestly feel like fireballing that mana worm actually isn't too bad of a play in that situation. So now he's gone down this route, I think his play probably involves dropping an Emperor and shutting his eyes for a long time and hoping... Uh, I agree. I think that looks like the most consistent line with what Napaka has, has done here, but there is six damage in play, and there is yeah. essentially plus two spell damage on both of those spells in hand. One from the Mana Worm growing and one from the Drake. So that is an eight damage fireball and a four damage frostbolt. That is 12 damage plus six. That's 18 straight to the face and no way of healing outside of yog or a crazy cabalist tome in this deck so now because just decided he's all in on this flame strike turn and let's see how that pans out for him because it's definitely not clear oh, how this oh. is going to end because hugo <laughs> has decided to just go all in here wow and this may end differently to how it looked from napica this is a bit of a plot twist he missed both shots to the face as well, so he even has to miss the damage from the from the mana worm. This is catastrophic from Hugo. You say you say he made the all in play that turn. I mean, honestly, the all in play was point your stuff at the face. Right. Uh, that just relies on drawing some source of damage before your opponent can kill you, and you have ice block in your hand. So you are guaranteeing yourself a decent as, amount of draw, as well as every other secret in the game. <laughs> Yeah, so you have every secret in Hearthstone in your hand, which means you have a decent chunk of draws to pick up another burn spell. Um, you know, Firelands Portal will get the job done. Forgotten Torch, if that's in there, Fireball, Frostbolt, all that stuff. One Frostbolt was used early on on that swing turn, but honestly, if he was going to go all in, because he was kind of all in either way, right? He was either all in on damage or yeah. all in on minion presence. I think the just burn face all in is actually a higher percentage win rate. It's not relevant this turn, but it'll be relevant next time. He can do 20 damage, can Napika, this turn. Because that polymorph ball represents an extra four, and the two fireballs represent seven each because of the mana worm. 
Mm. Uh, so going into next turn, he can set up lethals in all kinds of ways here. So do we just jam all our spell damage on the board right now and yeah, try and set that up? I think we do. I like it. I am a fan. But people who put Kabbalist Tome in their deck often want to cast Kabbalist Tome. This is a pattern that I've seen developing. Yeah. And you also have this ice block now, so that gives him more incentive to do that. But yeah, you're right. People who play the card seem to want to play the card, which makes some sense, but I'd rather they didn't do that. Right, I mean, and that's not meant to sound in any way patronising. It's just if you are of the mentality that you want a Kabbalist Tome in your Tempo Mage deck, it's because you want, you're comfortable in this situation yes. right here where you have nine cards and your opponent has five or six and you have the board. This is what you want. Um, the the fly by the seat of your pants, acolyte of pain, cycle deck, put a bunch of torches in my deck, dig them out, point them at your face. Like, that deck is a very different mentality to play. Um, so it's just kind of, of telling that people's deck building decisions say a lot about their philosophy as players and then kind of bleed through into their actual play style itself. Yeah, and it harps back to what you said earlier about you know players who bring an unusual class of Torch, say they bring priests, they're going to probably play that priest for exactly the same reasons you've just described so, and how you said earlier. Anyway, he can now set up this ice block and start pointing as much damage as he's comfortable with at the face. Yeah, he has to be uh, he has to be aware of the fact that secrets have just been developed by his opponent as well. So he is uh, in a serious vortex here of having to clear out all the potential options. So we've ruled out counter spell there by casting the mirror image, but you know mirror entity is still available, ice barrier is still available, vaporize is still available, you know, spellbender, mirror entity, all this stuff. Like he has to consider all these options. And when you have a hand of nine different options weighed up against, you know, five or six different concealed possibilities from your opponent, suddenly your turn gets pretty complicated. Especially when you don't even know, would you rather lose your, um, as a drake, or would you rather lose your mana worm? Right. Which one's even the best minion here? When you, when you do work out that there's a vaporize or something, which one do you even want to attack with? That's a good point. I mean, that Man Worm does six. I'm a big fan of dealing six right now. Sure, we have a whole load of minions in hand of the 4-4s. Four I guess the 4-4s four is not much harder to kill at this stage of the game than a 6-3, so... No. Uh, slight missequencing there. I mean, Vaporize was in the range. If he was going to cast Frostbolt that turn, there is no harm in casting Frostbolt on the face before attacking with the Drake. Sure. So, um, misstep from Napica, but um, he has this game all but wrapped up now. Two Fireballs in hand, opponent at 12... Ice Block has been played, but this is one of those games where Ice Block is not looking too good for one opponent, but it's looking pretty glorious for Napica because he is free to deal with this in any way he wants because he knows he's safe behind that Ice Block that he didn't even choose to put in his deck. Right, so the purpose for Napica's Ice Block is only to counter Hugo's Ice Block, which makes you wonder. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, is there any reason to do this with the portal? Uh, well, he could have portaled the Drake and then dealt 11 damage to face with the minions on board to leave his opponent all at one and then pinged face and there would be one less Azir Drake on the board. So now he may be in a position where he turns his 3-7 into a 4-2 just so he can proc the block on one. Uh, oh, he that, can't. He that can't doesn't do let him because he doesn't have to one. ping anymore. Yeah, this is actually a really potentially devastating problem here for, for Napica. If he didn't have just a big old pile of burn in his hand, this yeah. would be a really, really relevant mistake. The fact that he's you know, backed all this up with a couple of fireballs is making it um, kind of meaningless. But, you know, you can see the look on his face. He didn't want to make that kind of mistake. Yeah, and that's why he took his time there, just to make sure. Actually, <laughs> sure. He was just convincing himself, actually, this this just doesn't matter. But your instinct as somebody who plays a lot of Hearthstone is, oh my goodness, I've just ruined everything. Yeah. But actually, you haven't, because you have 22 damage in your hand. Right, but it, it doesn't it doesn't stop you being ashamed of the play, right? Like, right. no one wants to make a mistake like that, especially on a big stage. You know, perception matters a lot in Hearthstone, and, and players do get a reputation based off things like that. So... Players are always kind of worried when they when they make those kind of mistakes, but I'm sure that is just a one-off thing. He is a, a very solid player, but and just Napica taking a two-one lead. Talk about making yeah. amends. Casters yeah. also make mistakes and get reputations on them. 
Yep. So I know the score. Napica's 2 1 ahead going into this next game. Sorry to cut you off there. I just wanted to assert that I knew what the score was. <laughs> assert that you have, in fact, paid attention to the score this time. <laughs> Right, and we have this. Oh, I'm trying to work out exactly what these producers are doing. It's like they're showing them the available choices, and the players are selecting the decks outside of the game in case of any tech issues or something. Right. I think it, it is literally, yeah, they are just pointing at a deck in a list of decks and saying that is the one that I'm playing. That appears to be what's happening, just so they have a, you know, a pen and paper record of everything that's going on. And then the producers whisper to each other in the middle to sort of exchange information, and then they, off they go, and the game starts. It is a bit of an odd-looking, you know, roundabout way of doing things, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I assume it's relevant to do with setting up, I know, overlays and stuff, but uh, I guess it may come from other games where there's picks and bands that are really, yeah. really yeah, yeah, I can see it. sort of important with managers and stuff. It's probably just a hangover from those. It's kind yeah, of this, interesting. This information, this information is always passed um, to, to admins and production staff during major tournaments like this, but they normally just do it through the Battle.net client. So there isn't yeah. you know, so someone approaching the, the desk over and over again. So interesting that Japan have chosen to go with the, uh, the personal touch here, but um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me. They, they want to make sure everything is uh, as, as, as backed up and fail safe as possible, and there is nothing more fail safe than pen and paper. Yeah, and uh, it is running incredibly smoothly time-wise as well. Yeah, between matches, we're not having to talk so much, and the the Japanese feed, which we are piggybacking from, can't see the production thing going on. They've got their casters on screen at the time. So, yeah, nice way of doing it. And yeah. into, I'm just going to let you take this away. I think. Thanks, buddy. So we have got a game of Patron Warrior versus Tempo Warrior. Now, Tempo Warrior has not changed much since the days where it was a dominant deck. Patron Warrior has changed significantly. It's been through so many different variations. It's been a Tempo deck that was playing Corcron Elites and Bloodhoof Braves for a while and Frothing Berserkers and trying to curve out and kill people. Before that, of course, it was the Warsong Commander OTK deck that everyone loves literally every single person in the world it was their favorite deck um and yeah. now we've kind of come full circle with uh some people trying to get that otk feel back into it with those cards that you see right there the arcane giants which can be discounted down to zero one two mana by casting a bunch of spells you slap charge on one of them you chap a, uh, slap a faceless manipulator on it and suddenly you're dealing a ton of damage from hand Right, and this deck is insanely hard to play. There is so much going on in it in terms of, do I need my OTK? Do I just want to get a board full of 8-8s? Eight mm -hmm. um, do I want to get a board full of 3-2s? How long do I want to wait for those things? Do I want to hang on and like start reducing costs early? Uh, but it was a deck that for a while, I think people thought was going to be refined into an incredibly powerful Tier 1 deck. Uh, it does seem to have sat down a bit below that now. Yeah, I would I definitely agree with that and definitely agree that it's an extremely intricate deck to play. It's it's fallen off as well because, you know, every build of Patron was always very difficult to play, but there's a distinction between, you know, difficult and forgiving that's important. Mm -hmm. And Warsong Patron Warrior was so powerful that it just by default became forgiving. Yes. You could you could win games without being good at it just because the deck was absurd. Um this deck is just nowhere near that in terms of power level. So in terms of trying to get a powerful win rate out of it, you have to be incredibly well-versed. Yeah, and again, Nepic has shown that he's played this a lot. Um, obviously, no hurry to deal with anything on the board yet. If you hurry, you lose for the large part with this deck. Yeah. Um, just, I'm just trying to stop looking at Varian Rin at the top of the screen. It brings back memories. That but... is a Varian Rin. Uh, Napica here probably just going to try and do what all combo orientated decks do and draw a lot of cards. So it seems like the Acolyte's fine. He'll be weighing up just how much damage he's expecting to take, though. Yep. Um, unless there is exactly a Corcoran Elite or Fiery War Axe, this is um, going to draw two cards a great deal of the time. You know, Tempo Warrior is not a deck that really leverages their onboard minions with buff effects. They just kind of keep curving out with uh, with stats and power plays, like the Arathi Weaponsmith that you see there. So um, he's, he's 
pretty good decision to play the Acolyte there. He's going to draw two cards an awful lot of the time, and those two cards that he's drawn are a big deal because they were Commanding Shout and Inner Rage, and this is the primary engine of the deck, really, is this Commanding Shout uh, Pyromancer package that's been borrowed from the Wargan OTK deck, essentially. So why did and nobody play this sooner? Sort of? Every time I see this happen, I ask myself that question. Essentially, we're all idiots. I, I just don't understand why no one put this together. We played every ago. combination of those two cards in every possible combination of decks, apart yep. from in Old School Patron. Yep. I, I, I mean, Pyromancer came in. For a while, in the in the first build of standard patron that Crane made mm -hmm. and was very successful with, there was a Pyromancer in that deck. Why wasn't there a Commanding Shout? I don't know. I just after the nerfs, he did it tackle. again. Yep. Uh, same guy, same Pyromancer. Actually, slightly yep. different Pyromancer, which was the Red Herring, in that the Pyromancer had a period where it was operating not as intended. Correct, yes. And so I think people, when that was mended... Just took it out of the deck without thinking, hey, let's put Commanding Shout in. Some people did, yeah. I I am one of those people, I will confess. Um, I I am as guilty as of being an idiot as anyone is. But yeah, this that engine appeared in, in Wargan OTK Warrior, and then it was borrowed by the, uh, the Cthulhu Power Cycle deck. And then suddenly just every warrior in the world was like, okay, I kind of want to draw my deck and clear my opponent's board at the same time too. This, this Pyromancer Commanding Shout idea seems like a good plan. Yeah, I mean, it's just turned up in every single combination of everything, including, like, Cthulhu Turbo Draw Warrior now, as it's pretty yeah. much gone. Um, like you say, everybody and their dog is now sticking this in. But, again, it's, it's incredible that out of 50 million people, nobody sort of did it sooner and did well with it. Now, now this is uh, interesting from Napaka. Napaka seems to be considering patrons this turn. Now, if he's patroning... He's definitely using an inner rage because it's just not powerful enough to make two patrons here without the inner rage. Right. If he does that, there is a five attack patron on the board and a Sylvanas. So two of his patrons are gone immediately because one dies and one gets stolen. Right. That does not seem overly strong to me. The situation he's in, though, is he's facing down a lot of damage and he has a handful of good stuff. So anything that just buys him some time might not be the worst idea. I mean, Whirlwind Execute buys him time. Sure. I, I, don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. He gives up some patron activators, but he has plenty more of them in the deck. And Whirlwind Execute puts him nicely in range of just being able to plop Arcane Giants anytime he feels like in the future. Right, and that's that's the complicated part of this deck. Well, it's, it's not complicated to plop down an 8, 8 for 5, but you know, in terms of saving your combo or just making minions. like And yeah, he's going to be in a position where he can just put 8, 8 on the table. That seems decent. Uh, what is happening? Is he DC'd? Both players look very, very confused by whatever has happened here. This is a, a bizarre scenario. I hope this isn't a disconnect. Especially as we're in a really sort of tent point of the game. Napika I... seems to be accepting his fate. He does. He looks... I mean, Hugo looked confused, but, you know, like you could understandably look confused with what just happened, right? Like, just raw patron on the board, go. That's confusing. Napica just kind of looks devastated with his play, if anything. Although there is now an admin coming over, and he is trying to explain something here. So maybe there is a DC situation. Love to try and get word from someone as to what's going on here. So Napica's... I... Yeah, he is getting the admin in the background. We can see is communicating, but I feel that Napica is taking the blame. I mean, we are just wildly speculating. Yeah, here. sure. I mean, we're just guessing, but just going from his facial expressions, normally the first thing that happens when a game stops responding is the player starts jumping up and down and crying and screaming and shouting and waving at everybody. Yeah. Whereas Napica just looking and sort of head in hands and sort of carried on. Yeah, I mean, what what confuses me is that I just don't see any line with patrons that turn that was a good play. So I'm confused as to like why the patron ever appeared on the board in the first place. It just it's a really really baffling situation. Um, but it appears that Napaka is just going to continue to rope out this turn. So hopefully we can get some sort of word from our our Japanese liaison as to what exactly is happening here. Otherwise, we are completely in the dark, and I can only apologise. But no, it looks like Napaka. 
is just going to go ahead with the whirlwind execute here. So he is continuing to play out the game, which I can only assume means that this game is progressing as normal. Yeah, although he is roping every turn and not doing a great deal. So maybe he's buying time to see if the admins can fix something for him. Whilst uh, not knowing what the ruling is going to be simultaneously. Well, I think Whirlwind Execute was the play that turn. I also think Whirlwind Execute was the play last turn. Um, so that may or may not change anything. But yeah, now now he's just kind of in a world of trouble because he just had an entire turn of extra damage before executing that Sylvanas. And that just kind of means that he's dead to Grom. So yeah, bit of a mess. Yeah, and I'm certainly promising nothing because when casters promise things, they're usually wrong. But neither player seems particularly distracted. No. This this seems to be business as usual now. Both players seem to be back engaged in the game. And honestly, I wanted to make the point. We saw Napica with a very shaky play towards the end of that Tempo Mage game mm -hmm. with the, the misordering on the ice block. And we you know, went on the diatribe early in this matchup of how difficult this deck is to play. Yep. Um, in which case... Do you, after that shaky performance with the mage, want to be going into this situation playing an incredibly difficult deck? I mean, you don't, but the, the other option is wait until it's three all and play it. Sure. So try and get it out of the way while your brain's at least half functioning. Um, because at three all, if he's if he's a nervous character, and we have seen some you know nervous characters over the over the time we've been casting Hearthstone. It, it may be best to try and get the hard one out of the way. If you know you're a nervous character, though, bringing a really complicated deck may not be the, the best lineup choice. You do have to factor in your own abilities sometimes. Yeah, it's weird because for, for Napica, this is this is not his first rodeo. This is not his first time at the Japan preliminary. It's not his first time making it to this point. He, he made it to the same stage in 2015, so he should have at least some level of experience with this kind of atmosphere. And he honestly, like, Obviously, again, we are just wildly speculating as to what has happened here, but he does seem to be, you know, suffering under the studio lights and the pressure just a little bit. Right. The the producers haven't instantly run on start offering decks. Oh, yeah, actually, they have. Just wondering if Napica is still waiting for a ruling of some sort, but yeah, I think they're waiting on something. So, again, I would I would just love to get some sort of word. Yeah, we're trying to get word from our Japanese contact, but he has got a lot going on. So yes. we'll... yeah, we we do have a liaison that's kind of keeping us up to date with when and where he can. But you know, we are we 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 are item number number six on his list of things to do or something like that. So he is a very very busy man, and I'm hoping that we can we can get some sort of word as I keep saying. But looks like the admins are fully involved now, and there is going to be an extended conversation here with Napica to try and get to the root of whatever it is that's happening. Yeah, and they're all there. Everybody's out there sorting it out. And this guy Unfortunately to for Napica, though, everybody did not get in there in the game that he just played. Wow. Sotl mm. never misses a chance to make Hearthstone-related dad jokes. Oh, sorry, I've, I've, just for that, I get to take the next five minutes off. It's all on you. Sure. I'll just talk so through the production crew, looking mm -hmm. at Napica and asking, like, why did you play that turn so badly? Did you run out of time? <laughs> would, you like, would you like a medic? And so I mean, it did look like he, he had a short disconnect there and then like pressed buttons to try and get anything to happen which involved a patron yeah, appearing what, on the board it like to me as well yeah I but agree. then straight afterwards it looked like he was fine with it and he waved the admin away almost i also agree with that assessment so in terms of guest stone which is what we're now playing yes i think it's really difficult to even guess but i'm going to guess that this is going to be a regain because he now has everybody explaining to him what's going on. They're showing him a ruling, I suspect. There's a lot of text on that page, and he's being told to read it. Mm. Again, just talk stoning, guys, because this is all we have to go on, unfortunately. But I do feel that maybe Napica there was just... They're, they're picking classes, definitely. But whether they're picking for a regame... And what the ruling is, we're going to have to just make up when we see the scores in the corners and the classes picked. 
if they're picking classes, then I'm going to assume that the result of that game stands. Because if it was a re-game, there would be no need to pick classes, right? Unless the rules say you re-pick. Sure. <laughs> Which they probably don't, but we've seen some pretty interesting rules over the years at various tournaments. Luckily, Blizzard HCT events are usually very, very clear-cut. But, you know, who knows what's in the rule book sometimes. So uh, take a moment here just to, uh, well, uh, Hugo now does have an admin accompanying him, but for uh, for the last couple of minutes or so, there was there was three people over sat, you know, negotiating things with Napica, and Hugo was just sat chilling on his own on the other side, just waiting to play some Hearthstone, kind of in the dark as to what was happening. So looks like the admins are making their way away. It looks like we might be ready to resume a game here. So this is as big a mystery as it is, and that game has been awarded to Hugo. So that game stands two games to two now. Okay. So re-queuing his patron deck yep. and queuing it into the mage, as you guys can see. So Napika, whatever happened there, has got a lot to overcome. He looked a bit shaky at the end of the mage game. And then obviously he's now got to just try and put over whatever just happened. He's got to put it out of his mind and try and play OTK patron really well. And he's off to a good start. Fiery War Axe is huge in every single matchup. No one really needs telling that. But in this matchup particularly, Fiery War Axe is nuts. I've made the point already about you know needing to kill every early game minion that Tempo Mage plays just to reduce the amount of damage. That is so very true for this matchup because for a warrior deck, this deck does actually not have a huge amount of life gain in it. Just a couple of shield blocks. Right, yeah. And, I mean, uh, one of the things that Patron used to do to win this sort of matchup was just armour up for a million using two armorsmiths and some whirlwinds and get out of range of, of any aggressive deck and any, well, any deck, basically, was one of its routes to victory. And now it doesn't have that. It's a lot more tightly packed with the Pyromancer package. And So, so yeah. decision time for Napica and his first real diversion path of this game... He could have chosen to just straight up go ahead and uh, Wild Pyromancer, Blood to Ica, the 3-2 there, just to clear it off the board, get himself two one-health minions on the board. Or he can choose to hold on to the Pyromancer for more long-term value. The the greedy play here is going to mean that he's going to take a beating in the meantime from the 3-2, which, by the way, that mirror image that we have talked a lot about this broadcast is absolutely huge in this scenario, protecting the 3-2 from the War Axe. Um, but he's going to take a beating in the meantime, but it does mean he gets to catch additional things like water elementals in his Pyromancer turn. And now that execute is going to pay dividends for Napica. Yeah, being incredibly patient there. And it used to be, like I said, a lot easier to be patient when you had those armor smiths. But now when you're facing a mage that you know can burn you from 18, 21, those sort of numbers spectacularly easily from about turn eight onwards being patient is still the correct play but it's, it's a lot harder to actually do in practice when you're sat there and it's staring you down and this is just a beautiful board clear here yep that water elemental comes down napica rewarded for his patron uh patience patrons that's not a word it is not. Uh, <laughs> picks up the extra water elemental there using the pyromancer as the activator for his execute and he still has his fully intact fiery war axe that he can still continue to pick off minions like sorcerer's apprentice with yep and he's dealt with the threat of the water elemental which means that he can actually use it as well yeah and getting like a free turn here uh thinking whether to battle rage but uh, that seems kind of sad it it does but having just used the pyromancer and not really having minions in sight in your hand that battle rage isn't getting used anytime soon Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have a patron combo going off anytime soon. You've just used your Pyromancer Commanding Shout, which is your other big engine for Battle Rage. So if you're going to aim to draw, you know, three or more cards with that Battle Rage and get significant value out of it, that is a long way away. Yeah. And, yeah, he's just going to get through stuff, but he's going to wait for a moment or two. Having that Blood to Ica might be a decision maker there in case he does get a turn eight patron, I guess. Yep. Uh... Now we may see him, well, you could Blood and Whirlwind and then Battle Rage. Yep, I like it. That's uh, pretty intensive, but it does get you those two cards to replace the two you use. 
Yep. I mean, the the Icar is is doing a job. You know, you're you're putting it to good use. The Whirlwind is is not a, a huge impact card in this matchup. So you know, cycle those two cards out for two different cards with the Battle Rage. I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I mean, his deck's getting pretty thin. That's one thing that this version of the deck does do is it rifles through incredibly quickly. Old Peyton went through its deck quick. This version relies sometimes on getting through the entire deck. Mm -hmm. Whereas the old patron used to only need to draw sort of 22 or 23 of its library. Uh, this quite often needs every last card to get that final combo piece. Yep, agreed. So there we go. We are going to see it. It also has the added benefit. We didn't mention three extra spells towards that Arcane Giant, which is a big deal because you will want to be pairing that up pretty soon with, you know, Faceless and Charge already in hand. He wants to get on with this in terms of discounting the, the Arcane Giant. Interesting decision he had there, um, whether to drop the Acolyte or just to make two extra armor. And I think the fact he didn't drop the Acolyte means that he's fairly comfortable with his position. He's, he's already in avoid disaster mode. Yeah, um, I like this play from Hugo. Um, just going all in here, using the coin as two damage, but most importantly, the Frostbolt to face, meaning that more than likely, this Flame Waker is going to need to eat a... Uh, second execute after he's seen the first one go down to be answered. Uh, mm -hmm. Outside of that, you're asking for a second Pyromancer play or double slam or something within that range. So by freezing the Fiery War Axe to face here, you are asking a big question of your opponent to be able to answer this. Yeah, and not dropping that Acolyte is actually what allowed that big turn to happen. Yeah. Because Hugo Absolutely. wouldn't have wanted to give three cards to his opponent. So... Actually, even though it looked like the safer play to gain the two two armor, it turned out to be like the the play that allowed your opponent to get aggressive. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Napika's concern there was I want to gain two more life. It's I don't want to just drop this acolyte on the board and get it cleared for one card. He, sure. I, he, he wanted to hold on to the acolyte until this turn where he could pair it with the slam or pair it with the whirlwind, and I think that's entirely justified. Mm -hmm. It just so works out that he would have loved that one source of extra damage right now right yeah i wasn't trying to imply that he did it wrongly just that it worked out kind of kind of really badly for him but yeah i mean look how thin his library is getting now as well so it's worked out well in some regards and he's going to draw the rest of everything oh no he's not <laughs> doesn't matter flame waker yeah napica's disgusted at the flame waker's behavior you have arcane blast in your hand my friend d d does this not look like a, a good plan what <laughs> Just do this What's any order that? you like. It just doesn't matter. Hugo is my new favorite player. That turn was amazing. <laughs> wow. That that ordering was interesting. That is just belief. That is faith. Belief in the face. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he can now deal with this on... Eight health. Uh, one turn away from Yogg. Not a million miles from just being able to combo win this as well. Uh, there, there has been a secret developed. We, we, don't, we don't see it um, on the, the overlay from this side, but I believe the, uh, the secret was developed from Yugo. Uh, so it's a good chance that that secret is the block. It's very likely. If it did, We haven't seen a Kabbalist tome, right? So... So yeah, it's I, almost I, I certainly block. Icebox is the only secret in the deck. It's, so the charge um, win is not there. Nope. So we're going with patrons, and hope that the next spells don't all hit in the face. But the next spell is flame strike, which will just clear again. Yeah, he's just going to go ahead and execute it here, and uh, he's even if the the patron board doesn't go through. I mean. This is the power of this deck in a lot of ways, is that a lot of people even consider the charge combo to be superfluous. A yep. lot of people, myself included, just cut the charge for uh, Gromash and just, you know, have Arcane Giants. It's just eight eights that you can drop on the board after your opponent has had to scramble through all their resources to clear waves of patrons. You just drop some eight eights on the board. Um, and that's probably the world that we're going to live in here where patron after patron is going to come down, they're going to get cleared up, and then the 8-8s are just going to come out and break the back of the game because we might have eight to eights. see Yogg come out here at some point just to deal with the Grim, with the grim patrons themselves. Right, Napika is actually doing a good job of the thing that people say you can't do and is playing around Yogg a little bit here. Yep, uh, absolutely. Just developing a, a decent enough board to try and force the Yogg out of the hand. 
alongside any of the, you know, if it takes three removal spells out of hand, that's good as well, obviously. Yep. So Mana Worm here does get buffed by the Polymorph, so it contests the uh, the surviving patron on board, but any time you uh, leave a surviving patron on the board, you are terrified as to what is about to happen to you. Right, Napika weighing up his options. Uh, he'll have a reasonable idea that Yogg is waiting, actually. Now, that, that card's been in hand some time now. It has. So he has uh, 10, 12, 24. So he has, if I am correct in my memory that the ice block has been developed, he has a pop here. If there's no secret, then he just has lethal. Um, so we're going to find out one way or the other. There you go. There is the secret. So he has the ice block popped right now. And which this is a good way to play around Yogg-Saron as well which is put your opponent down so low yes. that Yogg will almost always kill them if they cast it. Yeah, because they either need it to clear... If they clear your minions, he's more likely to kill itself. And if they don't clear your minions, you win anyway. So Exactly. And he's actually... This is interesting. He's considering just not even proccing it. Because Yogg would kill him through the block anyway and nothing else he cares about. Right. Yeah, but, uh... I'm not sure I like it. I'm just saying he's considering it. <laughs> I mean, that all <laughs> makes sense apart from the fact that it's nonsense. Yeah, apart from the bit where, what are you doing? But yeah, yeah. Um, I just thought I'd say what he was considering. Sure. So this is going to be very much a Yog game. That is back-to-back -back Yogs that have cast Resurrect as their first spell, if you are curious. Right. Sense Demons. That is going to be a pile of worthless imps in hand. Charge to the, the Yogg. irony. Yogg has charge. <laughs> the irony of a 15 damage charging Yogg. Ooh, that is not pretty. Ancestral Spirit on one of the giants making it even harder. Oops. That's the communion. There's the punish. Goodbye, imps. You, you will be said sorely that missed. With such happiness. Oh, you you will have you have no idea how much I like seeing people lose when they play Yogg-Saron. And Napika, through what can only be described as an incredibly interesting turn of events so far in this match, is three to a head, and probably will help to settle him down a little bit as well. Yeah, agreed. Um, I think. Honestly, that was a really strong performance um, yeah. in that game in particular. One line that I personally would have diverged on, I think I would have played the Battle Rage a turn earlier. Um, Napaka's line turned out just fine for him. He picked up the Whirlwind on the next turn to be able to get two cards from the Battle Rage instead of one. Um, so his line worked out perfectly fine. Uh, apart from that, I think his play was just perfectly on point. So um, he's obviously recovered. Uh, it looks like we did just get word from our, from mm -hmm. our Japanese correspondent here that he uh he was try like his it looks like his mouse disconnected basically and he was trying to click to continue his turn after dropping the patron and the game just did not register his clicks and refused to uh let him complete the play so yeah and they did discuss whether to regain that or not and the decision based on the rule book which we saw them reading to him was that um the decision was to continue and that that game was definitely a loss to him we knew that from the scores but just making sure to clear it all up that is what they ruled and so uh, ruled that it was basically whatever for whatever reason it was Napica's fault. Yep. And that that can definitely be a thing. I mean, if you rip the mouse out of the socket or something, yeah, you know <laughs> that is your fault. Yeah. And that, that and probably... Napica seemed to know right right the way through that we weren't sure because Napica seemed to know that it was basically his own fault as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, and he took yeah. it well, by the way. Um, yeah, he did. There, were, there didn't seem to be any salt or any complaining or anything. He's just got on with it, and you know, so far he's he's still looking in good shape. He's got on with it. He's put himself back together, and honestly, he he seems to be playing better since right. the incident. So, so Druid versus Rogue. Uh, Druid gets two goes at getting through as well, which is absolutely massive in this environment where no deck is a big favorite over any other. Having two goes at somebody with the same deck is a good position to be in. Yeah, absolutely. But remember, this is this is not the questing adventurer rogue or from Yugo, or is it? Sorry, hang on. Let me get this right. Uh, have I been looking at the wrong list this whole time? Yugo is playing Leroy Coldblood and questing adventurers in this list. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty aggressive. So it's a really, really greedy list. He's playing Double Conceal, he's playing one Shadow Step, and he's playing Leroy and Questing Adventurers. So 
his potential for a pile of dead cards in his hand is like even higher than the average rogue deck. So, what else can be shadow stepped apart from flashbacks to twenty fourteen Leroy? Uh, SI seven agent Barnes. Uh... Oh, <laughs> flashback! Shadow stepping Barnes is something I don't even want to think about happening. Edwin Edwin Van Cleef for the old plus two yep. plus two uh, or plus four plus four by the time you replay it. So. It is interesting how cards go out of decks that were perfectly fine due to, you know, a one mana nerf to Leroy, whatever, and yep. then go missing as if that card is no longer on the face of the earth in a deck where it's really been relegated from card number 26 to card number 36. Mm -hmm. And people just forget it exists. And then when it comes back, it's like me asking that question. It's like, well, why would you play that? And the answer is, it's still okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the, the the difference was is that Shadow Step was generally being played in a in a pre Emperor world where Leroy cost four mana. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, the combination of Leroy Shadow Step, Leroy Shadow Step, you could you know you had enough mana to then fit in your Cold Bloods and Eviscerates alongside it, so you just did a ton of damage. Um, since the nerf, the since the nerf to Gadg to uh, to Gadgetan and Leroy, the deck has just become a lot more tempo based. We play more quality minions like tomb pillagers azure drakes you know all these things have step by step made their way into the deck so that it's not just as reliant on dealing you know 24 to 30 burst yeah. damage in one turn it just beats you up a little bit with minions first um so from that essence i'm always a little bit surprised when i do see the shadow step coming back in because right. it does feel a little bit superfluous a lot of the time and as i said rogue is already a deck that sometimes just beats itself by drawing a pile of dead cards when you put Shadow Step in there as well, sometimes you're just asking for trouble. Yeah, and I mean, it's not a rare occurrence either. Sort of everybody's played somebody on ladder who's insisted on just showing all these naught mana things before conceding. Yeah. And if you haven't, you have that to look forward to and it will happen to you sometime soon. The old prep, coin, conceal, prep, concede play. Yeah, <laughs> at which point you think, well, you chose to put those cards in your deck. Don't blame me. Exactly. Anyway, back to the game that's actually taking place right now. Napika's doing the rogue things rather well. His next turn is... If this Fandral makes it through the night, mm -hmm. Napika's next turn is completely and utterly crazy. Uh, nourish into whatever you'd like to do, possibly even double Raven Idol with the two mana you get, on top of building up your crystals, drawing cards... Uh, you could say this this Fandor needs to die now. I'm not sure. Yeah, but the, how. the question does then become, yeah, how exactly? I mean, yeah, coin tomb pillage are great. Fandral just gets to sit on the board, and this is the absolute dream. This is this is just not supposed to happen. This is absolute fairy tale stuff. Like yeah. turn four mana Fandral on your four mana turn into just immediate nourish. This is like one in a million stuff for this deck. And the Wrath, that is the ultimate punish. Fandral is just potentially running away with this game single-handedly. Right, and Napika will be going through his mind. Obviously, he's looking at a place at the semi-finals if he picks this game up. And he'll be going through his head, well, he couldn't kill it last turn. If he can't kill it next turn, I've got Raven Idol, Raven Idol, <laughs> Feral... <laughs> There's a teacher in my hand. I can point things at your face. I mean, his next turn wins the game. Yeah. If this Fandral doesn't die. And we can see that Fandral's pretty safe. Uh-oh. Oh, please, no. Uh, 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 it's okay. okay. I think the, it's more of a production spectator issue than okay. it is a Napica ripping his mouse out of the screen issue. That would be a devastating disconnect because, you know, I would go as far as to say that this game is, is approaching inevitable yes. conclusion at this point. Um, inevitable conclusion being the name of the rule in the uh, fighting game tournaments. I don't know why I suddenly came out with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, but yeah, generally the Hearthstone ruling is lethal on board or sorry. Um, so in this situation, it would almost be called a re almost always be called a regame. And uh, yeah, you go recognizing the severity of the situation, double fan of knives and blood mage committed to taking care of that fan draw. But you know what's pretty solid after your opponent has just used both of their fan of knives? An army of one one minion seems like it's something that you would want about now. It looks reasonable, right? Um, yeah. And we have seen people in recent tournaments try to be clever and leave Fandral up. 
I've seen it two or three times, and it doesn't end well ever. No. Like even one wrath quite often just snowballs into drawing another living route, which you know, let alone the hand that Napika had there, which was end of game immediately. Yeah, I mean it's just it's just madness, right? Like leaving leaving Fandral up, I would say is is on average more devastating than leaving Emperor up with a yeah. with a with the same hand size, right? Like. A three card emperor and a three card Vandral. Leaving those up for a turn will probably come back to bite you equally. Yeah, I mean, casting a card twice seems good. You're doubling the mana cost <laughs> or something just seems good. If you cast uh, Nourish. Oh, you're, you're, you're the best, deal. Yeah, casting a card twice seems good. Because yeah. that's what it is. You just double no, I mean, the amount of mana you get. Incredibly succinct. I, I could have used. 135 words to describe that same scenario and wouldn't have come anywhere close to putting it that <laughs> succinctly. And so, obviously, Hugo, despite the fact he's building up a hand of conceals and questings, which does look menacing, by the way. It does. He, that, um, that, hand, that hand kills an opponent very, very quickly. It's going to have to get through a two-turn lethal here from Scenarius. It is, and it is not capable of doing that. It needed that one buffer turn, that one turn of breathing room to just get a huge questing on the board, jam some cold bloods on it, and then maybe Leroy with Eviscerates could follow it up for the win, but that is just going to push through. I was actually just one turn lethal by the looks of things. Was there a concede? There was a concede. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, I didn't think it was lethal. Sure. And Napika, again, we've stated this before that game, but after the, the issues... It's almost like it woke him up. Mm -hmm. uh, played the last two games spot on. Obviously, playing Druid spot on when you get that hand is kind of not that complicated. But the OTK patron game, he managed to keep himself together, played it very patiently, got a lot of value out of killing that water elemental. Yep. And actually, it's like he needed the wake-up call is, you know, don't pull out your mouse in the middle of a game. And, you know, that's an alert that maybe you're not on it. And he, he just woke him up and he's through to the semi-finals and we'll see that semi-final tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think of all the players we've watched, he's had potentially the the, the shakiest play, the weakest play mm -hmm. in the first half of his series, um, right up until the point where that that mouse disconnect issue came in. But then since then, he really he really tidied up his play. But yeah, before then, the you know the 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 miss sequencing with the popping of the ice block, and then just, you know just that whole turn where the mouse did end up disconnecting. I just. I just don't see the world where Patron was the play that turn, and that just seemed to be what he wanted to be doing anyway, which right. kind of tells me his mind wasn't in the right place. So after that, he managed to tighten things up. He played very impressively. As you said, not a great deal of user input needed for that Druid game at the end, but an impressive performance with the, the Patron deck when it mattered. Yeah, and hopefully that, um, that comeback both sort of on the board, but mentally most in particular, I think will stand him in good stead going into... What is an important semi-final tomorrow, just to remind people who are tuning in, this is the Japan Preliminary. It is also the Japan Summer Championship. The winner is the best player in Japan, or declared such at least, and goes to APAC for a chance to go to the Blizzard BlizzCon Finals. So, lots on the line for these guys. Yep, and as I mentioned before, you know, we, we had a conversation and you were saying, like, you know, you, you're a man who's, you've, you've casted Chinese tournaments mm -hmm. and Southeast Asia tournaments, Japanese tournaments, you know, you've, you've probably covered as much, you know, Eastern Hemisphere Hearthstone as any man in the Western Hemisphere. And, yeah. you know, you were telling me that Japan is one of the strongest regions that you've been able to cast. So the, the winner of this tournament that takes the Japan seat in the, in the Asia Pacific, in the APAC qualifier, is probably in, in looking in pretty good shape, right? To, to go yeah, through Yeah, very much so. Well. I mean, the seedings go something like there's one of the players qualifies by being the highest points earner in the region. <laughs> that guy is kind of automatically favourite, whoever it is at the time. Uh, then you have two players from South Korea, two from Taiwan, one from Southeast Asia, one from New Zealand slash Australia, and one from Japan. And Japan, for me, is probably second place on that list behind the top points earner guy okay i think they're that strong a region in terms of not necessarily their depth they've only had hearthstone in japanese language since october last year so a lot of the players only started playing october last year but they do have strength in the top echelons of people a lot of the players were playing on na got good quickly 
and obviously the players who are interested in learning the game who've been playing for about a year now they've been learning from the guys who are playing in the english language versions and they've come along very quickly just not cutting to adverts yet while we make sure that the ruling is that there's no re-game for game four yeah i'm i'm very curious as to why these two players are still sat down talking to admins right now this this concerns me a little bit so we will of course stick with it until there is some sort of clear resolution being given to us yeah, I think Hugo's just accepted his fate where the rules say, well, we gave you a game, what more do you want? So, but he's just checking that everything is above board and he's definitely within his rights to do that. Like, it is not your job at a tournament as a player to be the one to accept your fate. It is absolutely the admins yeah. to tell you your fate. Yeah, 100% agree with you. There is there is nothing wrong in any situation of just saying, hey, can we just refer to the rules in this situation? What do they say exactly? What's the scenario and that? That appears to be what is going on right now. You know, and uh, I know players sometimes, if they do something that is deemed unsporting, and, you know, where the admin has said, hey, would you like to regame? And they say, no, I'd like the win, please. Sometimes that reflects badly on the player. Agreed. And not often enough does that reflect badly on the admin. So, yes, yeah, sit there and let the admin tell you what the situation is. Yeah. Um, again, like our, our reference back to, to fighting game tournaments, but there's. There's a rule where, you know, there is normally on an arcade stick, there is a pause button somewhere within reach of the buttons that you're actually pressing. And if you press that button, the game pauses and that interrupts the flow of the game, right? right. And there is a ruling that says that if you press that button, the kind of accepted, you know, social convention rule is that the other player can choose to take the win from you for doing that. Right. And I cannot stand that ruling because it should just be a blanket decision that says if you pause... You sacrifice that round, right? If you're playing a game where you're pressing a million buttons at APM speed and involving strategy and skill, and you press the wrong button, you don't deserve to win, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but it, it, like, it puts the onus on the player to be the bad guy, yeah, right? exactly. And, and say that I want to take this win, whereas, as you've yeah. been saying, the admin's decision should always be final. They should be the arbiter. It should not be down to the players to decide between themselves. But... It looks like we finally have resolution after all of that, and Napica has been declared the winner. So he is going to be the first player to book his spot in the semi-finals positions that we will get to tomorrow. Right, and we will have one more game for you this evening. So I'm going to put on the interview for those of you who are interested in his body language or anyone who can speak Japanese, of course. And we'll be back for game four. And the breaks have been pretty short. Like I know that's a bit of a meme, but they have. So we'll see you <laughs> soon. Cheers, guys. ヒロの<笑> はい。あ、あまり覚えてらっしゃらないです。あ。ちょっとトラブルがいろいろあって覚えてない。そうですよね。お疲れ様です。はい。では続いてのはい。<笑> あり覚えてないですか。あれ本当に何でしたっけ。そうですね、いろいろトラブルもありましたから、なかなかそうですよね。大変お疲れ様だと思います。はい。では、じゃ最後に感想を一言お願いいたします。<笑> ここまで超えて本当に嬉しいです。明日はちょっと気合い入れて、あとは回線のラグがないようにお願いしたいです。そうですね。はい、ありがとうございました。明日の準決勝と決勝も頑張ってください。はい、ありがとうございました。<笑